for Rolling Stone. All right, this is a home interview, Medford, New York, 16th of March, 2005, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full uh, name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Nicholas Cassio. I was born in Brooklyn, Fort Greene section, on December 2nd, 1913. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I had a very limited education. I had an elementary school up to the eighth grade. I wasn't too bright. And then uh, after graduation, the eighth grade, went to continuation school at that time where I learned the trade of printing for two years, what they call continuation school after the public school graduation. And from there, at age 16, I was able to get employment in the printing industry and I learned my trade in the printing industry. And I was in there for many, many years. Uh, would you want me to continue on? Uh, now, I was going to ask you another question. Do you, um, now you, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. I was one of the first of the, what they call at that time, selective service. They, they had the possibility of war breaking out at the time when President Roosevelt was president and they formed the selective service uh, draft. And I was number three on the draft and I was drafted in August of 1941. <clears throat> Alright, where did you uh, go for, for your uh, training? Well, from uh, the local board, we, they sent us to Penn Station and uh, at they gave us the nickel for the car fare on the subway, and from there they transferred us over to the group at Penn Station. We got on the Long Island Railroad and drove. Uh, they took us out here to Yapank, which is only about 10 miles from my home, and uh, I had an introduction there of uh, what was going to be taking place. And fortunately, I had been there three or four days, and I was on KP duty on Sunday, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, my brother knew about. Yap Hank, and he drove my mother and my sister and my brother-in-law out. They took a dinner out, an Italian dinner, a picnic area in Yap Hank, which was very good. But the following day, we all got together and we started to go to the basic training camp in Camp Wheeler, Georgia. We got on the train. It took us a couple of days to get there, but that's where we had the basic training in Camp Wheeler, Georgia. How long was your training? It was 13 weeks I, 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 at that time. Uh, we got there sometime in September, and we were there until uh, December 7th when the, well, I had a, at the 13-week basic training, I was on a 15-day furlough, ready to leave to come home for furlough and then go to wherever they are going to assign me. But the war broke out December 7th, and we were in town at the time in the theater looking at a movie, and the an announcement was made that all military personnel had to report back to the camp immediately that uh, Sunday afternoon and then the following day do you remember the reaction you were with a group of uh, well the only reaction was whether we knew that there was something was happening in the world that there was a possibility that war might break mm -hmm. out so it, it didn't surprise us that the, the, the event in Pearl Harbor took place we didn't know where of course but uh, then we started discussing that's how we're going to be affected by it so we reported back to the camp and they told us, so get all your belongings together, put them in a barracks bag, and just sit tight until you get further instructions. And the following day, on Monday, I got assigned to do uh, a luggage carrying down at the railroad station in Macon, Georgia. We, we went from the morning after we had breakfast, we went down to the railroad station to help load up the luggage of uh, veterans that were, going to, that were being assigned different areas. So and then we got back to camp, my, my ba ba barracks bag was all p put together, but somebody put all my clothes and personal belongings in the bag, and we were ready to ship out. I didn't know what was in the bag, but uh, all of a sudden the guy handed me a guitar, and what had happened in, while we were in Camp Wheeler in basic training, the uh, GIs used to get at that, t that time $21 a month, and they were always gambling. So this one fellow lost his monthly check, or his monthly money, and he wanted some more money to, to gamble, and he decided to sell his guitar. And 
all I had on me was three dollars and fifty cents, and I offered that to him. He gave me a guitar for three fifty, which I carried with me for quite a while. But I didn't know how to play the guitar; just I had something there to to strum along. Where did you go when you left uh, Camp Wheeler? Uh, from Camp Wheeler, we were on the trains for a couple of days, from what I can remember, and we got to Louisiana, Camp Claiborne, excuse <coughs> me, in Louisiana. And when we got off the train, we were surprised at what we had to step into to get to the buses to take us to the camp. It was all full of mud. There, there had a lot of rainfall there, and recently it must have been two or three inches of mud that we had to get our way through and to get onto the buses. Then when we got to Camp Claiborne, it was just as bad in Camp Claiborne. A lot of mud around there, so we were uncomfortable with that situation. But then when we got a, assigned to our room, and we wanted to wash up and clean up, we, we go into the men's latrine, and uh, there was the, these young fellas from the 164th uh, Infantry uh, Regiment. regiment. Uh, they were in the, the the latrine area, but they had a two-quart bottle of whiskey. They were sharing with three or four of their friends because of the war breaking out. They ready. They knew they were ready to go to war. So we went there to join with the 164th Regiment, Infantry Regiment, and we stayed there a couple of days, and then finally they got us going again. And from the uh, Camp Claiborne, we were on a train for three or four more days and every now and then we would stop at different towns, get off the train and exercise. And uh, one of the main events that I remember in Eugene, Oregon, we got off the train for exercise, but the regimental band was out on the station ahead of us, and they were playing the music, military music, and we were able to march around the area near the railroad station of the town where the people came to uh, look at us uh, getting off the train and and marching up and down the streets nearby the train station. And uh, from that point there, we uh, arrived at San Francisco later on. It was a good three or four day trip. I enjoyed watching the snow-capped mountains as we were traveling in the train. And then we got to San Francisco. We got to a place called the Cow Palace, where the, the previous week they had a, a, an animal show of cows and cattle and lambs and all kinds of animals. That's probably why they call it the Cow Palace. So we stayed there for a week, but while we were there, we had to do guard duty on the, uh, for the field artillery, or the coast artillery. And we were up on the hill overlooking San Francisco Bay and the Bay, uh, the Oakland Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. And we, we were there for a good week. And from there, we went to, uh, on a train again, and we went to Spokane, Washington where we stayed for a few months. And uh, this coming Saturday, March 19th, which is St. Joseph's Day, we got on the, the ship at uh, San Francisco from, San, from Spokane, Washington. We came back to San Francisco, get on the ship, which was named uh, the President Coolidge. And we were on a President Coolidge ship going across the Pacific Ocean. And from the, there... Uh, we, did you go in a convoy or a single ship? Pardon? Were you in a convoy or a single ship? No, uh, well, uh, as, as far as a single ship is where the troops were, were on, but we were guarded by destroyers oh, okay. and naval ships mm -hmm. around us. Now, I, th I think there must have been another co convoy, another ship with troops on, but uh, we were on this President Coolidge ship, and it was a very good ocean liner. They, they never had a chance to remove all the furniture and all the goodies that the people went on vacation, so we took we had the privilege of sitting on sofas like this and beautiful uh, surroundings on the ship. But the one thing I remember, uh, i never forget, while we're talking to the merchant marines on that ship, one of them got friendly with us and he started asking what kind of work we did in our life. And I told him I was a printer and he was the printer on the ship. And he used to uh, cater to the uh, people uh, uh, that were on the, on the ship that uh, they had to print up a, a new menu every day what they're going to have for breakfast, dinner, and, and supper. And uh, he made a side, uh, <laughs> what would you call it, a little, little extra money for himself. He would hand a piece of paper around to the passengers, ask them if they would like to have their name printed on a certificate as we crossed the equator. Uh, 
and, and, uh, and I think for a dollar, two dollars, whatever it was, he would set up the names, and then he asked me to help him print the the the, the names of the troops that were on the ship. He, he, he sold the certificates for one dollar for each uh, of the members of the military on the, on the ship. Well, he set up the type and the composing stick, and I was able to print it on the printing press, what they call a, a platen printing press. But the one good thing about it, I didn't ask for any money or anything like that, but he says, well, how's, your, how, how's your food with the military? I said, well, it's not bad. He said, well, from now on you eat with me. And when I went downstairs in the boiler room, all the men on the ship were all dressed in white clothing because they had to be careful. If they got any oil, they had to spot where the oil was coming from or whatever was leaking. But we had delicious breakfast, delicious dinners uh, on, on that ship. And all my friends in the, in the company would wonder where I was. I wasn't uh, at the table with them. And then when I told them what I was eating, they couldn't believe it. The, 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 the beautiful meals that we had uh, you know, because of this merchant marine. So it was a good friendly trip. And we got to Melbourne. Um, yeah, Melbourne, Australia. And we got to Melbourne and said, well, while I was on the ship, one of my buddies, very friendly, but a quiet guy, but he was always by himself thinking of what he had to do, I don't know, but that's the way I thought about it. But when we got to Melbourne, he asked me to accompany him to, to town. We got a pass to town. We helped unload the ship. And we each got a pass to town. And he knew where to go. He went to General MacArthur's headquarters in Melbourne. And I waited there in the office, and while he was going around where he had to go. And after about an hour or so, he came back and he said, we got to go back to camp. I said, what for? He says, come on, we got to go back to camp. So we got back to, not the camp, but back to the ship, to the Coolidge. We got back to the Coolidge and he went up to the company commander's uh, quarters and he presented the papers. And the company commander says, how the hell did you do this? And he's, he says, well, that was my job. Uh, while I was in civilian life, I was working for the War Department, he told me, and he was a lawyer. And uh, while he was drafted with me in the military, he was thinking about what he had to do. So he had the sense to uh, go to General MacArthur's headquarters and see the right people, and he got a transfer out of the infantry into MacArthur's headquarters. But before he got out of our company, he had to have the regimental commander's approval. So the company commander gave him a pass to go see the regimental commander on the ship. And the regimental commander just bawled the hell out of him. And he cursed at him. He said, how the hell did you ever do this uh, without my permission? Now, he didn't care about that. He, he got what he wanted. He got to be transferred to MacArthur's headquarters as a warrant officer. He came later on because of his uh, attorneyship uh, experience. So that was a good experience that we had. But then I went back uh, with him to the, sh to the ship, and I said, I got spoiled. I didn't get a chance to see Melbourne. I didn't get a chance to go sightseeing, whatever. So the next day, I didn't have no assignment to uh, unload any of the supplies, so I took it upon myself. I went past the MPs. They didn't even question me if I had a pass or not. I went back to Melbourne that day. I looked around. I saw the sights. The, I went up a big hill there, and first thing you know, the uh, the, the bus driver there, or the trolley car conductor, uh, asked me what I would like to see. I said, well, "I should see whatever the, the the sights are in Melbourne." He said, "Well, you're going to come upon a, one of the nicer sights in in Melbourne. You got the St. Patrick's Cathedral here." I said, "We got St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City." He said, "Well, this is similar." So I went in there and said my prayers there. Came back out, took the the trolley car back to Melbourne and looked around the town and then when I came back to the ship it wasn't there. The Coolidge had pulled away. So I said, where's, where's the company? Where's the infantry? And they said, well you are AWOL. I said, how come? They said, the ship that now all of the troops of the 164th Infantry were on this Coolidge ship and uh, they were all transferred to three smaller Dutch ships. To, to, because there wasn't all a room on one ship for the, for the regiment. So they split up the three battalions and they put them on three different ship, Dutch ships. And when they went from Melbourne, they went to New Caledonia before us. They were about two or three days ahead of us. So they, we had a report as AWOL to the MPs and there was one company from the regiment that was left behind 
because of this situation that they knew that certain personnel would n not report back to the ship, they were AWOL, AWOL, but they had other uh, duties to perform beside that. So we went on the ship with, with Company I, and we had better conditions than the, the other troops on the three ships. But when we got back, when we got to New Caledonia, we didn't get wel welcomed very well. Everybody was booing us and calling us traitors and whatnot and deserters. So I felt so bad, you know. I didn't. But I said, "Where's my barrack bag?" They looked at me. Your barrack bag? You have barrack bag? I said, "Yeah." I, said, uh, I had it all filled up with my personal belongings, and I had a radio, and I had my guitar. I said, "Forget about it. It's all been distributed." So I had to get my clothing all together again, and we went to New Caledonia. And we were put in a small area of um, near the camp uh, for a week, more or less uh, punishment. But we didn't have to do anything extra, just to, that we didn't associate with the, the troops. So then they start killing me. Hey, you went AWOL. I said, AWOL? Hey, what's AWOL? I, they said, it's absent without leave. Oh, I said, I didn't know. I thought it was what I was thinking about. I was a warrior on location. And they start to laugh on that. So. We were there in, uh, in New Caledonia from, uh, I think, somewhere around April of 1941 until um, we got the word that we had to go to Guadalcanal. But we didn't know we were going to go to Guadalcanal. But from New Caledonia, after being there, we kept on training in, in uh, New Caledonia. And then from there, we got on the ship at, uh, Mel at uh, New Caledonia with uh, Numea. The, 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 the boat base then, and uh, from there we got on the ship and went to Guadalcanal in October 12th of 1942. Mm -hmm. But when we got to Guadalcanal, we had to climb down the rope ladders of the ship with a full equipment, with about three feet of water, and get on the on the Higgins boat. We got on the Higgins boats there, and we landed. We got on 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 shore. And we put down our, our equipment and barracks bag, and first thing you know, we got a red alert. It was a, a signal that the Japanese Air Force was going to attack us. So they told us to take cover. And I didn't have a chance to take cover with all the little coconut trees. I was on the beach. And I remember I was in trouble. I was scared. I was frightened. I didn't know what to do. But I remember I had a prayer card in my pocket that Bishop Sheen at that time compose a prayer and he said when you're in trouble say this prayer I memorized the prayer you know and he said oh my god help me help me help me and I said that prayer over and over again I was on the beach between the water and the coconut trees and we were attacked by the Japanese uh, Navy the Japanese Air Force and whatever artillery they had on land in, on Guadalcanal for six hours we were under attack. I was able to get up and run towards the coconut trees and find shelter there. But every time a, a bomb would burst on top of the trees, the, the, the coconuts would fall off, the branches would come down, and you didn't know what was happening all around you. And people got hurt here and there from the heavy weight of the, the coconuts. But unfortunately, in that attack, we lost uh, our... Uh, Military doctor who was with the military with the first aid squad, uh, first aid uh, the company, and he was killed. He was the first one killed on Guadalcanal in our uh, regiment. I never forget that day. On I forget the day of it. It was on October 12th, I think it was, of 1942. So uh, from there on, do you want to hear any more? Oh yes, yes. From there on, uh, we had to do patrol duty. We were in a, a, what we call Company H, was a heavy weapons company. We always had an assignment behind a rifle company. The rifle company would go out on patrol, and we, we would back them up about maybe two or three hundred yards uh, away from them while they were on their patrol in case they needed a machine gun or a mortar fire. We would supply that and help them out there, which we did from time to time. And um, then uh, after we had two or three of those assignments, we had an assignment through maybe a couple of weeks in a place called Henderson Field, where the uh, 
Navy Air Force uh, uh, with the Grumman aircraft at that time, they would land and take off from Henderson Field on their assignments. And I never forget, one plane came in and landed, and the, the pilot got out, and the co-pilot, or maybe the, the gunner in the back of the, I think it was the, the Grum, one of Grumman gunships, they both got out of the plane, and all of a sudden the plane burst into flames. I said, oh my God, what a, what a terrible thing to see. But fortunately, they were able to get out of the plane. But there was many casualties that took place from there on. And then later on, we found out that in that uh, naval group of fly, fly, uh, pilots, there was uh, Joe Force. He, he was one of the uh, re recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And later on, he came from North Dakota, which was my outfit. My, uh, the 164th Infantry Regiment was originally from North and South Dakota in that area in the Midwest of the United States. And um, he came from that area and then later on when he got back home in civilian life he became a governor of North Dakota. I don't know if he's still around but I think he, he might have resigned or passed on. I, I'm not sure. But anyway, Captain Joe Force was one of the well-known pilots of that era. Then we continue with the, the assignments of patrolling. And another thing I remember about Guadalcanal, after we were there for quite a few years, we never changed clothes for days upon days. And then we got a chance to bathe ourselves in the Lunga River when we washed our clothes, whatever we had, get a fresherness uh, on our bodies. And suddenly, while we were in the water, we were about at three feet of water in this Lunga River, we felt a sting across our legs. We didn't know what the heck it was from. We thought maybe a bomb had been dropped somewhere. Unfortunately, we found out later on, one of the farmers that was with the North Dakota Infantry, which I was a part of, he decided he wanted to go fishing. He saw all those uh, tropical fish with the stripes on them, and the colorful stripes, and he decided he wanted to have some fish for, for dinner, whatever he had planned to eat. And he had a grenade, threw it in the water, pulled the the pin threw it in the water, and that's where we got the shock yeah. across our legs. I said, oh, brother, this guy is really something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was quite an experience at Well Canal that we had uh, quite a number of um, incidents of patrolling. We had to support the, inf the, the rifle companies whenever they needed mortar fire or machine gun fire. And there was another time there where we had to cross another river and uh, in order to help us uh, avoid getting sucked suck under the water, it was about five feet of water, and then I was only about five feet five at that time, which I still am, so they had this rope across the river, about 1,500 yards across, so we had to hold on to the rope and walk across the river with our backpack and the, and the military uh, equipment. So that was another experience in Guadalcanal, but uh, fortunately, we came out of it all right, thank God for that. And around Thanksgiving time, we were relieved of some of the patrol duties and some of the uh, uh, assignments that we had up on the hills. And we had a good Thanksgiving dinner at that time. But the only thing with that the dinner, we didn't have our, our barracks bags or the the, the, the metal plate, what I forgot, the, the mess kit. We didn't have the mess kits in there with us at that time. Some of us lost it. and we're, we didn't know how to, eat, how to eat our meal. So we went down by the ocean and we washed off our helmet, took off the, the metal helmet, off the, the, the leather helmet underneath. We washed it out with the ocean water, came back and put the food in, in the helmet and ate from there. So that was quite an experience. But uh, Now were you ever directly under attack by the Japanese? Oh yeah. <laughs> As I said before, we, we had a uh, six hour attack the first day that we got on Guadalcanal. Well, well, with we had, their infantry. Oh, yes. We, we had, uh, the, uh, let's say, we were attacked. Uh, our, our, our outfit, 164th Infantry, was attacked on and off from time mm -hmm. to time. They would notify us pl plenty of time that there was uh, Japs proceeding towards us, and the rifle companies ahead of us, they would do the attacking on the Japs that came towards us, and we were ready to supply them with machine guns and mortar fire, which we did. And uh, they came on and off. Oh, then, we, of course, we had uh, what they call um, 
the air raid, uh, what, uh, what they call the name, Charlie. Oh, washing machine, washing machine Charlie. Charlie. Pardon? Washing <coughs> machine Charlie. Yeah, right, washing machine Charlie, yeah. I don't know the name Charlie. Uh, and they, they would attack us at, at least every day, every night. When it get uh, dusk, uh, about 8 o'clock at night, we'd get the red alert and we would have to get, uh, go into our bunks and uh, look, seek shelter. And there's one, one point I remember later on when we went to a, another island, the Salaban Islands, where one of our uh, fellow members, we were watching a movie in Bougainville. Well, well before I get to that part, we, we had uh, been in many uh, operations of, uh, on patrol. We always backed up the rifle companies on patrol. And um, we had a number of those. And then when it came around uh, December of 1942, we uh, more or less were relaxing and we, and we got settled up in a the, in the camp-like atmosphere where we didn't have to do too much patrolling. But every now and then we did have to go out on patrol. But another occasion I remember that when we got the Guadalcanal, we had to reinforce the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal. They had been there from August, I think, in 1942, when they invaded Guadalcanal. And they had a good operation, but they were, we were supposed to relieve them. They were supposed to come off the island of Guadalcanal, and we would take their positions. But what happened with that six-hour attack by the Jap... Uh, Air Force and the Navy for six hours, they couldn't get off the island. So they remained on Guadalcanal with us for quite a while, or up until maybe January of uh, 40, uh, 43. But in the meantime, we had the, oh, a lot of the latest equipment that we had trained with in, in basic training that we carried with us, and all of a sudden they were stealing our M1s. They were equipped with Springfield rifles which is a single shot rifle and we were equipped with the five uh, car cartridge uh, Garan M1 so <laughs> they had a little problem with the, the Marines on that but we got along with them pretty good and another highlight of that uh, operation was that we were up on a hill there somewhere and we were waiting for advancement orders and all of a sudden we seen this big tall man coming by with a uh, what they call them big tree stump walking down there. and it was General Vandegrift of the 1st Marine Division. He was there to inspect us and commended us for our participation in the uh, different uh, patrols and different occasions. But uh, while he was there he said, what are those men doing down that field? And they're uh, down the hill. And they were down the hill about maybe 50 feet below and uh, a number of chaps were laying there dead. They had been uh, killed the day or two before and we were there to patrol and reinforce the area so the general wanted to know why the men were down the hill and then when he saw them come up the hill he wanted to know why were you down that hill and they said we were souvenir hunting and the souvenir hunting they were taking all the gold teeth out of the Jap's mouth that were laying there on the ground I said, oh boy these guys are really something because you know we have a different a way of uh, of thinking about things. They come from the Midwest and we come from the city. We didn't think of those, those type of things. But uh, we were there for in Guadalcanal until uh, March or April of 1940, let me see, 42, 43. We got off to Guadalcanal and we went to Fiji Islands for a rest period. We were in Fiji Islands for a good six months which is very, very comfortable. We got to know a lot of the people there. We felt like civilians again. We were well dressed and we conducted ourselves politely with the people there. Got friendly with them and they would invite us to different occasions and on and off. And we had, of course, we had the USO would have a, a dance every week so that we get passes. On the pass would be every other week we can go to town and and uh, socialize with the people there. Did you and, ever get to see any of the big names in the USO shows? Yes, uh, we saw Bob Hope there with his uh, troops, Francis Langford, and there was a girl dancer. Her first name was Peggy, but I can't remember her last name. But I do recall I was close to the stage 
and the MPs were guarding the uh, entertainers to make sure nobody bothered them. So uh, while the, the other entertainers were on the stage, there was Jerry Colonna and the dancers and all the Francis Lank was saying, Bob Hope was off on the side stage and he was talking to the Marines. There were Marines, uh, the, the MPs, the, excuse me, the MPs that were guarding him. And uh, they were talking up. First thing I'm hearing a conversation, and, and they asked him, "How do you get along with uh, all this traveling around, doing entertainment, and all that? You keep in shape. You, you must be real tight." He said, "Well, I keep in shape." They said, "What do you do to keep in shape?" <laughs> I never forget the story he told. He said, "Well, I, what I do after I, I do my entertaining, I go back to my headquarters, whatever it is. It might be a hotel, or whatever they put me in, and I hang at the bar." And they said, you, you hang around at the bar. Well, you're not a drinking man. He said, I didn't say I was a drinking man. I said, I hang at the bar. Then he explained what he meant. He said, when I get at night to go to bed, before I go to bed, my entourage, they have a bar. They put between the frame of the, the door or the bedroom, whatever, and they attach it there so he can hang there and stretch his back. He had a little problem with his back. And he would have about three inches from the floor where his feet... The toes of his feet would touch the floor, but he would hang there. So that's where the, yeah, they got messed up. They thought he was hanging out at the bar. Instead, he was hanging on the bar. <laughs> so that's what I remember about Bob Hope. But then when later on we saw other performers and movies with the USO that we appreciated. And uh, I can't remember all the other entertainers' names, but I remember that occasion with Bob Hope and his troupe. It was very good. Oh, from you want to hear from the from there sure. from from uh, Fiji Islands, we uh, had uh, we had to do basic training, you know, constantly keep in shape and all that. And uh, from there, it always happened. It seems that we always celebrated Christmas holidays, doing something militarily, either on patrol or whatever. But this time, we got off the island of uh, uh, Fiji Island. We got on a ship to go to Bougainville, which is part of the Solomon Islands, where, where Guadalcanal is part of the Solomon Islands. And we did a good six months of, uh, my, I would say, my light combat. We didn't get too much combat as we did in Guadalcanal. But we did the same thing we did in Guadalcanal. We had to support the rifle companies every time they went out on patrols. We had to back them up with the heavy weapons, which we had at that time, machine guns and mortars. Then later on, we, we found out that we had support that was supporting us. It was an anti, anti-tank outfit was there. I forget the number or the name of the anti-tank. They backed us up, and we were backing up the riflemen. So it was quite an experience. We were there in, in uh, Bougainville for quite a while until the time came in 1945, where just around uh, the holidays, Christmas holidays, New Year's Day, I'm pretty sure it was. Now we had to board the ship again, we went to the Philippine Islands. And we went to the Philippines and uh, we had to help whatever military action had to be taken there. It was mostly guard duty. And uh, we stayed there until uh, it was time where we were, uh, we were in a, what they call a, a number pick. If you were in the service for a certain amount of years, you were eligible to go home on furlough. So I was one of the last of the group that had the the time and because the the uh, national guardmen from 164th Infantry they had much more time than I had so I had to wait until they went home and then I was one of the last of the eight to uh, be picked to go home for for furlough but while we were in Philippines the um, order came down to the company commander that everyone had to take a trial run of climbing the rope ladders on a ship and coming down on the rope ladder again to get in the Higgins boat and then go back up on the ship and I was in no mood to do anything like that so the, there was eight of us ready to go home waiting for bus for transportation to take us home and the captain says no one is exempted everyone has to go on this here practice run so we were in no mood to do anything uh, with full, full uh, strength and uh, we had to do uh, that uh, practice here uh, Get on the Higgins boat, climb the rope ladder with our equipment, get on the deck of the ship and then wait about a half an hour later, go back down on the rope ladder and back on the ship 
and then come back again upon the ship. The, the second time I had to come back upon the ship on the rope ladder, I couldn't make it. I got up on the top, and I was in the in the small Higgins boat, like a rowboat you might say, and from the Higgins boat into this rowboat, and I was just waiting, and I couldn't push myself to get onto the deck. I had to ask the crewman to help me up. I felt so ashamed that I didn't have the strength to get onto the deck because that was the last part of the of the practice. And then we got over that there, and we went back to camp again. Then the following day, we got the transportation to take us back home. So we went back to we went to Lady in Philippines, boarded the ship, waited until it took off. But in the meantime, while we were in Lady Philippines, the word came across on the newscast that they had dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. So we didn't know what it was all about. We started asking questions, what's the atomic bomb, where's Hiroshima and all that, because that was why we were trained to get on that ship. There was a, a ready invasion of uh, many thousands of troops to invade Japan. So everyone had to, take had to take part in that practice. But then we started to go home. How did you feel when you heard about this? That oh, we, we felt good in a way, but then we started saying, and we're not going to be part of the invasion, you know. We, we did all this other work uh, to, to get this far in the war, and now they're going to j invade Japan, and we're not going to be part of it. That's how we felt. We, mm -hmm. we felt good that we're going home, but at the same time, we didn't feel good that we're going to be part of the, the attack force. So we, then we got over that after a day or two. We we're listening to all the reports coming over on the ship as we're crossing, as we're going home on the, on the Pacific Ocean. And then... Uh, it was a few days later they dropped another bomb, and then we said, "Boy, this is really getting to be a, a really destructive war." And then uh, finally uh, the Japs gave up, and uh, the, the, we were relaxed. But at that time, and uh, I don't know if I told you before, but I got an attack of malaria. But uh, when I was in Fiji Islands, I was always taking my adamant pills. Every day I take my pill to avoid getting sick with malaria. But after we got through Guadalcanal, we got to the Fiji Islands for a rest period, and I got malaria there, and I had to be in the hospital for a week. And I didn't like that because, you know, it took me away from my social uh, uh, enjoyment. But anyway, I got the malaria on the ship going home. And it was two, two days before we got to San Francisco. And they made the announcement, everybody up on the top deck, we're going to be under the... Golden Gate Bridge. You want to see the Golden Gate Bridge? And I looked at the sergeant and I says, I don't feel like going anywhere. I'm staying right here. And I f forgot about looking at the Golden Gate Bridge from the ship because I felt so bad with the second attack. I had a malaria. So uh, then we got to San Francisco and whatever they did there, they, they transferred it over to a place, a camp in Pitts. Is there a place called Pittsburgh in California? Yes, there is. Uh, that, that's where they sent us to Pittsburgh, and uh, it was an Air Force, a, a, airfield. And we waited there a day, and we got on the plane, and they took us back home to Fort Dix in New Jersey. And we stayed there a few days, two or three days. I had a chance to call home on by the telephone, because I never had much money to call, make a, a telephone call at home. And uh, I finally called and told them I'd be home pretty soon. Don't uh, count any particular day, I'll surprise you. And sure enough, we got there, I stayed there for about three days in Fort Dix, and got, finally got discharged, and they put us on a train, went to Penn Station in New York, we got out of Penn Station, and I hailed a cab. <laughs> I don't know what the fare was to Brooklyn, where I lived at the time. It must have been about $3, and I wanted to give the cab driver a, a dollar tip, and he refused to take the tip. He says, yeah, man, you know, you, you were just coming home from war. Said, Forget about it. Then, I thought he, he's going to take it. He wouldn't take it. But then as I got out of the cab, this little girl came running out of my father's store. He had a grocery store. And she grabbed me and hugged me. And I said, oh, Uncle Nick, Uncle. And it was my, my sister's daughter, a six-year-old daughter. She hugged me so tight that I couldn't really let her go. And it was so good to come home at that time. But uh, there was a lot of experiences that I had that I... I never forget, you know, and then every now and then something else will, will pop up in my mind that I have to uh, talk about it. But I, I, after I got home, I never felt like I wanted to talk about my war experiences. I think we, I felt that way with thousands of other GIs that were in there, military men. 
They didn't want to talk about their war experience because it didn't sound like it was a, a conversation that would make people, uh, you know, wonder. Did you actually go through all this experience? And honestly, I did. And that's the whole story. Mm -hmm. Now, you were going to tell us about uh, the Americal Division. How oh, yeah. Had its the name? Americal Division, when we got to Melbourne, we didn't know. We still, um, when we got out, uh, out of training camp, we, we met the troop at uh, Camp Claiborne. And we found out when we got to Calif California, before we went on the ship, that the, at that time, the military was composed of divisions with four regiments in each division. And the, 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 the 164th Infantry Regiment that I was assigned to was one of the four in, in a division. I forgot the name of the division they were in. But anyway, they, they broke them up. So when we got to New Caledonia, there was three uh, regiments there that were broken up away from their original division of four. There were four regiments in each division. So they were called, we were called the three re regiments, 132nd Regiment, I think it was, 186th Regiment, and 164th Regiment. And they called us the Bastard Regiments because we were separated from the division. And while we were on New Caledonia, they said this is how the name of the new Marical Division. The three divisions, uh, the three uh, regiments that was uh, called the Bastard Division were going to be there to um, institute the Americal Division. Americal was American troops and Caledonia uh, territory. That's how the Americal Division got started, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. But I also, one, one of the highlights now we know of the Americal Division was that General Cola Powell was the head of the Americal Division, I think, during the Vietnam War. Is that correct? I, 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 I think forget, that was after. I, I forget which war he was in, but he was the, the superior general, Cola Powell, was the general of uh, the Americal Division at one time. Yeah, that was after we, we got discharged. So that's the association that I wanted to bring out. Okay. okay. Now, do you remember where you were uh, and your reaction when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? I was on the ship. No, no, no. Well, when did he die? He died with what? He did? died before yeah. the atomic bombs. I think it was in April. April. Oh, well, then I was at that time. I was in the Philippines. Now I don't recall how, mm -hmm. what our reaction was at that time. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, you I was in, I was in the Philippines at that time? Mm -hmm. Did you uh, use the GI Bill at all? Did I do what? Use the GI Bill at all after the war? No, I I uh, was uh, more or less following what the GI Bill contained and how it would affect me, but I never made use of it. The only thing I, I, I made use of when I was discharged and I want to go back to work and my father says, you don't go back to work for a few months. He says, take it easy for a few months. And I didn't go back to work until 1946. It was three, I was, I was discharged in September of 1945, so I took those few months off at my father's request, I helped him with his grocery store and all that. But then I said, I want to go back to work as a printer. Did you use the 5220 Club during that time? Yes, I had. I, I did take advantage of that. Then mm -hmm. you, you reminded that 5220. Now, I think I only had that for about a couple of months, not too long. Mm -hmm. Then I was able to get a job. Because prior to the war, I tried to get into the union, the printer's union at that time, what they call a pressman's union. And they had what they call a big six. That was the people that set type, and that was a separate union. But my union, the Pressman Union, you had to be a craftsman in order at that time <laughs> to belong to the union. <coughs> Today, anybody can become to a, a union member. But at that time, if you were a union member, you also had to be a, an expert craftsperson in your field to get hired, and they, because the pay was much better uh, as a union personnel at that time. So I was able to get a job in a union shop, but there was only temporary here and there. So I had three different employment opportunities. But while I had th three different shops to work in, I gained a lot of experience on working on different machinery. And then finally I got a, 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 well, I got a, a good job for, for three, it was almost six months, where I learned uh, something about what they call lithography offset printing. And the fellow that was showing me in the, in the shop, 
And he says, go to the school and learn a little more. So I said, well, with the, with the GI Bill? He said, well, if you want to go to GI Bill, you can do that. But the school in New York, at that time was the New York School of Printing on 49th, on uh, um, 8th Avenue and 40, uh, 42nd Street. Yeah, 40, 43rd Street, right across the street from, the, the, Penn, uh, from uh, the post office and Penn Station and the Hotel New Yorker. I went there to learn more of the trade. And who was there as the instructor? The man who was working in the press on the offset press in the shop that I was working with. Uh, and he instructed me how to uh, learn the, the, uh, the lithography trade or the offset printing. And from there I was able to get good employment. So uh, then I says, well, this is good. I was getting at least $15 a, more, a week more than the average person in the non-union shop. But at that time you had to be a, a good craftsperson at, at doing your work to become a union member, which today it, it just changed. You just can become a union member no matter what your experience is. But I, what I remember there mostly is that uh, I met my wife at a wedding in January of 1946 <laughs> and we kept company for quite a while and uh, then uh, we had planned then to get married in 1948 and <laughs> I lost my job <laughs> a, a month before, no, a month or two months before we got married. We got married in January of 1948 and I had no work. I was unemployed. I was unemployed and I had to prepare all the particulars for the wedding. But then, at the, the wedding, about three weeks later, I applied for a job that was advertised in the, in the New York Times. I wrote a letter, told them my experience, but I didn't use the GI Bill uh, uh, benefits except just the 5220. Mm -hmm. That's about all I got. But I got a job there and I was there for a good 15 years. Good salary, good uh, promotion, and all that. And then finally, I had an opportunity to become a teacher at the New York School of Printing, teaching the same type of uh, offset that this other fellow taught me in, in my trade. So I had uh, a good experience in the trade, and then I had 27 years of uh, teaching at the New York School of Printing. But the New York School of Printing, at that time when I left the job, there's a man, what they call a manpower program, manpower development program that President Kennedy had um, instituted in his uh, uh, term. So I was there for two years and I was teaching eight adults, men that were in a trade that wanted to learn the trade that I had learned 15 years before them. So I had the experience and was able to teach them and they were able to get employment in that field. Of course, at that time there was a change in the printing field from letterpress printing to offset printing, which offset and lithography is almost the same and it's separate from engraving. So you had a lot of opportunities in that field. It just remind me now, I mentioned President Kennedy. While we were on Guadalcanal, on the hill, remember, never forget this, on Hill 260, overlooking Henderson Field, where the planes were coming into land. We never saw them take off because they were on another part of the field. The takeoff field was behind us, the hill, and the landing field when they came back from their combat or landing where we saw this plane go up in flame. But at that time we were up on the hill and at night, it was dark, really dark midnight, and we were just there in our, in our machine gun holes overlooking the hill, overlooking the Henderson field. All of a sudden we saw red lights up in the sky and then we heard the boom. And for about two hours we heard military uh, naval personnel uh, battle. A naval battle between the Japs and, uh, and the U.S. forces uh, uh, off Savo Island. Savo Island was about maybe 15, 20 miles from Guadalcanal. It was part of the Solomon Islands. And all we saw was these here big red shells going back and forth, and then all of a sudden a big explosion. We said, well, some ship got, got hit. We didn't know what ship got hit. But later on we find out that uh, President Kennedy at that time, uh, he wasn't president, but he was on his uh, PT-109. He got hit there and he was in the water and that's how he, he hurt his back. We never forget that experience too. So that was one of the highlights of being on the Hill 260 uh, observing the naval battle between the Japs and the United States. Hmm. Did you ever uh, join any veterans organizations after the uh, war? Yeah, I joined the veterans organization but then I wasn't too satisfied with uh, the way they were conducting their business. Maybe it was too early and I, I stayed away from that until 
or oh, maybe a good ten years, but then I, I got involved with the Catholic War Veterans in Brooklyn, and I forget the number. I, and I, I keep in touch with them. I send the annual dues to them, and whatever program they have, they send me their newsletter, what's going on. But I, I haven't had the time to, to be part of any uh, war veterans uh, organization. Mm -hmm. I got associated with my church in, in New York City, and I became very active in the church affairs and uh, with the Holy Name Society. I don't know if you're familiar with the Holy Name yes. Society. I became uh, president of the Holy Name Society with the Archdiocese of New York. And uh, there was quite a lot of activity going on in that field. And I was very happy doing that. But then we decided to move out to Long Island and I had to curtail my involvement with the church activity. But I'm so happy that we have a lot of good priests out here, well, although now there's a shortage, but we had some very good priests that, that take care of uh, the, uh, the requirements that we need for the religious... Did, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Oh yeah, I uh, I was out here until about... No, no, no we, we, I'm out here since 1981, but I was real sorry that I wasn't notified. One of my uh, friends that I've made very good acquaintance with, my buddies, he lived in uh, in Jamestown, uh, in North Dakota, where Peggy Lee, the singer, came from. He was a distant cousin, cousin of this girl, Peggy Lee, who was a singer. I don't think she's around anymore. She's passed away. But uh, I keep in touch with him, and I kept in touch with others. All of a sudden, he tells me, Nick, we just got back from uh, South Pacific trip. I said, Lloyd, where'd you go? And he told me. <laughs> The outfit, uh, he, he belonged to a military outfit in, in uh, North Dakota, and they got together as a reunion. They all got uh, on a plane. There was only a room enough for 50 people to go on a plane to go back to Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands, Pearl Harbor, and Fiji Islands. And he, he described what took place, and I was so mad that he didn't notify me ahead of time. I wanted to go here with him, with my wife. Mm. But uh, he went with his wife, and he said when they got to Fiji Islands, and they went to Suva, Fiji, which is the headquarter, the, uh, the main part of, uh, of uh, Solomon Islands. They said that when they, 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 they found out that there was a group of uh, soldiers, the GIs, returning for a reunion at uh, Fiji Islands. And they put on a military parade for the uh, 50 people that were there to visit. And they stayed with them for a couple of days. And they were well, well, well taken care of. Or they didn't have to pay for nothing. <laughs> And I said, hey, and you didn't tell me about it? And I said, Lord, you, you let me down. But I kept in touch with them. We have a reunion. They had a reunion every year in either North Dakota or uh, somewhere in that area, North of South Dakota. But mostly now they have it in Fargo or Bismarck, North Dakota. And then naturally the numbers are dwindling down. But uh, they, it was a nice uh, reunion. But every other year we would go. I went there about six different times with my wife. Mm -hmm. It was very good. We got to know. And now, unfortunately, a lot of the GIs are passing on, and we keep in touch by telephone, one thing or another. So, how, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, it taught me a lot of respect for other people. It taught, taught me how to pray for peace. And uh, Every time I hear of a story of a, a nation wanting to invade another nation, I start praying that it doesn't happen. And uh, with the situation the way it is now today, and just hoping this will end in a peaceful way, that uh, democracy will be established successfully in Iraq and, uh, and uh, Afghanistan throughout the world. But I start thinking of how our personnel is all over the world trying to teach people democracy for their own good. And that's what the effect from being in the military and getting to know people of different uh, backgrounds, how they feel about us. I never forget one time in 1964. Um, they had the World Trade Center, uh, not, they had the World's Fair in uh, Queens, New York, and I went to one of the exhibitors, and uh, I said, "How come you people don't get along with one another?" She came from the Middle East, and uh, I said, "How come you people don't get along with one another?" And she started going into a rage. She started condemning the Jewish people. I said, "Oh no, don't feel that way." I said, Look at the Jewish people in New York City. We get along with one another. Said, How can you guys can't get along? And she didn't want to hear nothing. She just wanted to show her 
my feelings about not getting along with the Jewish people. So I said, let me walk away from this before I get into trouble. But I always felt that my military experience gave me a lot of respect for others, no matter what their background. And every, every time when someone would come up to me, would give me a, a, a difficult uh, response, I would calm down and tell them, do you believe in God? And they would look at me, and then they know, realize that I was kind of serious. So that it has an effect in that way, too. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Mm, that's about it, huh? Yes. Well.